Praise God. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let's begin to worship the Lord tonight. Let's give God some praise tonight. God, we thank you. Here we go. God, we thank you tonight. Somebody say, God, you are glorious. Come on, lift up your voice. God, you are glorious. Shine, Jesus, you shine for all the world to see that you are glorious. If you know it, sing it with us. Sing, shine, shine. what's going on with the Assemblies of God in Southern New England? And whenever I'm asked that question, I know that they're asking the question about, you know, our, our geographic district. But within our geographic district, uh, our other Assembly of God churches. In fact, just in the, uh, the Springfield area, there are six Slavic churches, Assembly of God Slavic churches and a, another a JG church coming in Connecticut. So I was after a word of that. Uh, our brother's uh, vastly is uh, credential with the AG and uh, about to bring his church in. But my, uh, I guess it was six, six or seven months ago, uh, Pastor Alex invited me uh, to his church uh, to speak. And that began a conversation and a relationship. And then uh, we continued that. And, and part of the reason uh, I remember when I first visited his church, uh, it was before, um, you know, the invasion of Ukraine. I remember asking him, like, wow, how do you pastor with, you know, a 30-year church Russian, a 30-year church Ukraine, a 30-year church in Belarus? And he said, well, we, we're united in prayer, and we focus on the cross. 
And I thought, where else, where else would that group of people come together for worship? And uh, so I wanted uh, you to meet him. And I, I said to him before tonight, I said, we, we're gonna be united. We're, we're gonna work together in Southern New England, work together in relationships and planting churches and, and sharing resources and, and dream together. And, and I hope the same uh, for our Spanish Eastern churches, our Brazilian churches, et cetera, that there will be a point um, that we can all, in fact, I'll say one crazy idea. Uh, we're, at, we're at year 98. That means in two years, we'll be at year 100. And that particular date we have scheduled for our annual network conference is on Pentecost Sunday. Boy, it would be good to get the entire Assembly of God Church together on that day in Southern New England. So just an idea, I'll leave it there. So back to my friend Alex. I just, uh, I just asked him to come and get to know our friends. So welcome, and the Forgers and Vasily will, will correct anything that Alex says. Добрый вечер вам. Good evening. Для меня большая честь и привилегия быть вместе с вами сегодня. It's a great privilege to be here tonight. Если у вас будет шанс быть в Спрингфилде, я приглашаю вас в церковь Crosslight. If you have a chance to be in West Springfield, I invite you to visit our church Crosslight. Замечательная благословенная церковь, которая любит Господа. It's a great church that loves the Lord Jesus. Я родился в очень маленькой стране. I was born in a very small country. И в очень маленькой деревне. In a very small village. И в следующем году будет сто лет, как в нашу местность приехал миссионер из Нью-Йорка из Ассамблеи Божьих и принес к нам Евангелие. Next year will be a hundred years since a missionary came to uh, our country and br uh, brought the gospel. He was an Assemblies of God uh, missionary. Это было в 1923 году. It was in 1923. И огромное количество людей обратилось к Господу. And many people turned to God. Из этой местности вышли огромное количество служителей. From my uh, area, many... Um, Many uh, preachers came about. My grandfather was a pastor. My father was a pastor. My father was a pastor. My старшие братья они живут в Белоруссии, они тоже служители, пасторы. My two uh, older brothers are pastors. They still live in Belarus. Я живу в Америке 20 лет. I live in America for 20 years. И Господь дал мне большую привилегию трудиться среди славянского народа и быть частью ассамблеи Божьей. And God gave me a privilege to uh, pastor and live uh, and. And, uh, as an Assemblies of God church. And I thank you, brothers and sisters, for the uh, support that you give to our people even right now. And the awful thing that happened between the two uh, countries uh, is unthinkable, and I uh, pray that God will continue to lead us uh, as we pray through this situation. Наша церковь, она, как сказал епископ, она 30% из русских людей, 30 белорусов, украинцев. As uh, Bishop Nick already said, that uh, my church consists of 30% Ukrainian, 30% Russian, and 30% Belarusian. Есть люди из Прибалтики, из Узбекистана. There's also uh, people from, from the Baltics and from the Stan Brothers. Бог помогает нам жить в мире, и мы верим, что мы одна семья, и наше гражданство, и наше жительство на небесах. We live in peace together, and we believe that our uh, citizenship is in heaven. Я оставлю вам, уважаемые, один стих для благословения. I want to leave you one verse to bless you. Mark 4, 35. Mark 4, verse 35. Вечером того дня сказал им, переправимся на ту сторону. On, this, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Я не буду проповедовать, если вы хотите послужить, придете в нашу церковь, и я закончу эту мысль, я скажу вам вот что. I'm not going to preach tonight. If you want to hear this message, come to my church and I'll preach it to you. Все, что случилось. Аллилуйя. Мы будем на той стороне. We will make it to the other side. Мы переправимся на ту сторону. We will make it to the other side. Мы пройдем эти трудности. We will make it through. Господь поможет нам. God is going to help us. Наш корабль не утонет. Our ship is not going to sink. Мы будем там, потому что Иисус сказал. We will be there because Jesus said it. Будьте благословенны. Be blessed. Аллилуйя. Аллилуйя. Hold on a minute. Will you stand together with me? And um, 
And just join me to pray as I pray both for, for, for Alex, who really represents, um, he's like the presbyter for the whole, you know, New England Northeast area for the National Slavic District. Uh, and I just, I just think this is a significant moment. It's going to be a continued significant moment. And, and um, we stand with you, but we also pray with you. So let's join me in prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for Alex and Vasile. We thank you for them taking this moment to be with us, brothers, not only just in the faith, but in New England. But yet, Father, we know that every Sunday, every time they minister to their, com their congregation, uh, there's a heaviness and a weight that's on their shoulders as they minister to people that all have relatives in a very difficult moment. Father, may your grace prevail. May your power prevail. May the work of the Spirit prevail. Strengthen the arms and the hearts of Pastor Alex as he ministers. Father, in moments when he's not sure how to lead and not to say and how to move forward, God, we pray that you will supernaturally give him those words week in, week out. And we as a community gather with him, pray for him, and pledge before you, God, to continue walking with our churches in this region as a part of the Slavic district. We thank you for them. We pray your blessing on them in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. God bless. God, we believe in you for a supernatural response. The God who did great things yesterday is the God who is still doing great things today. There is no fear, cause I believe. There is no doubt, cause I have seen your faithfulness. My fortress. Over and over I have a hope Found in your name I have a strength
tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it That you drew someone like me To carry your victory yeah. Perfection could never earn it You gave what we don't deserve it
on, lift your hands to victory this morning or this evening. God, we thank you. Never lost a battle. just wherever you need breakthrough I just want you to picture that that thing in your way the power of the spirit breaking through because that's our promise thanks be to God who always leads us into victory amen always leads us to victory team amen good to be on the winning team god bless you look at your neighbor and just say it is awesome to see you here in the house of the lord tonight amen what a humbling opportunity what a great great honor to speak and to share with you my colleagues here in this great harvest field of southern new england i wouldn't be anywhere else Oh boy, it's going to be rough tonight. I, I said I wouldn't be anywhere else. Where'd you think God was going to call you to, huh? Come on. We've got the greatest harvest field in all the world, and it's the greatest harvest field in all the world because it's where God has placed you. And uh, so consequently, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Nick, thank you for this opportunity. What a privilege to serve under Nick these last few years as uh, God has not only gifted him with many uh, talents and abilities, but has given him an extremely comprehensive understanding of the scope, the potential, and the possibilities that lie before us as a network. We have good reason to be optimistic about our future. Amen? Amen. Amen. I would be remiss if I did not mention as well what a blessing, what an education it was as well to serve for a number of years under Pastor Bob Wise as our superintendent as well. Should the Lord tarry and I fulfill my remaining one year in this office as assistant soup, uh, I will remain available uh, to help in any way I can. 
but I do anticipate stepping down at that time next year. I'll be 65 at that time, and I don't know about you, but I want to make room for some younger men and women to lead this fellowship and to lead this network. And all the young men and women said, amen, amen. amen. I'm sure that even now God is, God is preparing those individuals. I've been very blessed, lived a very blessed life, wonderful heritage of faith within our Assemblies of God fellowship. Blessed to be the son and the grandson of an Assemblies of God minister. For those of you who don't sort of know my background or story, I have uh, made in Springfield, Missouri, stamped on my belly button. Not tattooed, stamped, all right? In, 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 in my generation, it was a stamp, all right? I, just, just having some fun with you, okay? But this blessed life got a whole lot more blessed when I met Jackie Larimore at uh, Valley Forge Christian College. And uh, uh, we, uh, she's also a third generation of Somebody's of God minister. On June 19th, 1982, we said uh, our I do's, which means we are now just a few weeks away from celebrating 40 years of marital bliss. Thank you, Jackie. We have a picture. I don't know if I put the pictures up as I make reference to them, if you will. We have a picture of Jackie and I together. There we go. And um, I had a little bit of hair at that time, but it, it, that's why we use that picture. But uh, for the first 20 years of our married life, Jackie was in education, both public and Christian education. And then uh, 2003, she came on board to be my administrative assistant. It was clear that I needed a lot of help. And uh, people ask us, well, what's that like? And I was not in the session with about men and women leading today. So I don't know if I'm going to say the right thing here, Gina. <clears throat> but uh, people ask, well, how's that, go be how's that work being your, your wife's boss? Well, there's days in the office I have to remind her who the boss is. And when we get home, she reminds me who the boss is. That's kind of how that works. God has blessed us with two amazing daughters Kimberly, our firstborn, married Clark, Clairvoix. They gave us our first grandchild, Savona. Sky, who's now three and a half. And uh, we just announced to our congregation a week ago on Mother's Day that another baby is on the way. So appreciate them doing their job as our children. And um, Clark, and uh, Clark serves as our young adults uh, pastor at Calvary Christian Church in Linfield. Our second daughter, Kendra, who is here in the building, uh, married Sterling Key. And Sterling and Kendra gave us our second grandchild, Salem. And uh, they serve at Crossroads Community Cathedral in East Hartford under Pastor Sean Wiles and just doing a great job there. A blessed life, a blessed life. And, and when I talk about the blessings of the Lord, uh, of course, I cannot omit the great experience of serving as senior pastor at Calvary Christian Church in Linfield, Massachusetts, for nearly 34 years now, where God has blessed us with an amazing, wonderful congregation, extraordinary board, and uh, amazing leadership team, 12 associate pastors. I'm finally like Jesus. I have 12 disciples. I just want to know who that one is, you know? I just, which one is it? And, uh, of course, like 2,000 years ago, they all deny, it's not me. It's, it's not me. But uh, God has done exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. And remember, this is how the rest of the verse goes. According to his power that is at work in us. Which leads me now to share with you what I believe God has brought me here to say for these moments together. And while I'm humbled and honored beyond words to stand before you tonight, I'm also happy to stand before you because I'm just an ordinary guy with no special talents or abilities. That's not humble pie. That's just telling it to you straight. Remember years ago, Harvey Mepelink asked me uh, to share a testimony at one of our network events. I said, Harvey, there must be a hundred other people uh, better qualified to give a testimony uh, you know, and he said, Tim, we talked to the other 99. None of them are available. We are stuck with you. So I think maybe at least for a few moments tonight, you're kind of stuck with me. And yet, you know, our God chooses to use ordinary people. People who will dare to step out in faith and believe him at his word, trust him 
at his word to do extraordinary things. Bible gives us an example of such a man. He's referred to us as the father of our faith. His name was Abraham, and he was not a perfect man, but he was a man God could use because he dared to believe God's word. So let's dare to believe God's word to us tonight. Amen. We go to Genesis chapter 15 will be our, our text. Let me read it to you, all 21 verses. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Verse 6, Abram believed the Lord. Abram believed the Lord. Then he said to him, uh, then he's, verse 6, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, <clears throat> he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace, be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Thank God for names like Jones and Smith. <clears throat> Would you stand with me? You're going to be seated for a few hours, so. You know, they don't laugh at that at home either, but anyway. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for a word of prayer? Father God, thank you for these awesome moments we have around your eternal and almighty word. Holy Spirit, come. Teach us that which no man can teach us. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, hands and feet and mouths to respond in faith and obedience to that which you would teach us these moments together. Hide your servant behind the cross. May Jesus Christ be high and lifted up, we pray, in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hopefully you picked up an outline on the way in. I know that's kind of old school, but I'm old. So, and I, uh, we do have uh, apps at our church. I don't know how to use them, but we have them. And People know how to get the outline that way, but uh, uh, <clears throat> people will, rem will remember your sermons better if you have an outline. They'll take notes, and taking notes, guess what? It makes the sermon go faster, or at least seem like it's going faster. So a lot of good reasons, and they'll remember it too. So a lot of good reasons to, to provide outlines. Tonight's message, and what God brought me here to say is this one thing, and if you forget everything else, just remember this, God is, all capitals, is keeping his promise to you. Now, all of us have had people who did not keep their promise to us. We all know how, what that's like. We know, all know how disappointing that is. 
But what about God? Does God keep his promises? You see, it's been a while since God had made a promise to Abram regarding both his inheritance of the promised land as well as becoming the father of many nations. You see, I believe God has a place and God has a people. Listen, God has a place and God has a people for all of us that he's called to lead and serve in his kingdom work. Now, Abram knows that God would not lie to him, but the days and weeks have turned into months and now into years. And Abram learns in Genesis 15 what we all have to learn regarding a lifestyle of faith in God. It requires waiting. And waiting is something very few of us do well. Thank you for all those amens. Wow. Remember the one question you asked your parents a million times on that family vacation trip in the back of the station wagon? Are we there yet? When our daughters were teenagers, we used to take them to Creation, that outdoor Christian festival in Pennsylvania. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, kind of like a Christian Woodstock. I, it, was, it, was, it was tough for me to live through some of that. Jackie was right down in the front in the, the pit or whatever you call it, you know, body surfing and just, I mean, just going crazy with the kids. And I was in my very distinguished Assemblies of God outfit sitting in the back on the hill, but not really. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, but this became a thing. Every summer, we'd take the girls and start out with two girlfriends, and after a few years, we had the 15-passenger the church van loaded up, and, uh, and then eventually even two or three-car caravan to go that 500-mile trip every year from Linfield, Mass. to Mount Union, Pennsylvania. And guess what the most frequent question of me was on that trip? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Occasionally, they noticed the scenery. Occasionally, they enjoyed each other's company. But for the most part, they were concerned about one thing. Have we reached our destination yet? And that's a question, again, we all ask of ourselves in different ways all the time. John Maxwell and others have popularized the phrase destination disease. The idea that there's some magical place which upon our arrival will bring us the joy, the peace, and the satisfaction that we long for. I had a close friend who visited us shortly after we'd come to Calvary in 1988, and he walked into the sanctuary, and he said, oh, you'll have this place filled up in a year. Clearly, he was not from Massachusetts or from New England, and clearly he was not uh, talking to God. But, uh, but I understood that his statement was one made more out of our collective impatience than it was anything else. He assumed that the destination I desired was for that sanctuary to be filled. And while filling up that sanctuary was in fact a promise God gave me 34 years ago, he did not tell me when it would happen or all that I would need to learn in the process of seeing it happen. You see, God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives, a promise, if you will, and while being goal-oriented is important, God wants us to learn that arriving at, arriving at the destination is tied to how we take the journey and the lessons of faith we learn along the way. If God just placed us from, took us from point A and plopped us down at point B, there'd be no faith involved, very little learning, and very little growing along the way. And I think, I think God wants us to take note of who else is in the car with us on this journey that we call the life of faith. I think there may be some scenery or lessons from life along the journey from which we can learn and grow. And most importantly of all, we've got to remember if we're ever going to reach our destination, if we're ever going to see the promises of God fulfilled in our lives, if we're ever going to reach what he has for us, we've got to let God do the driving. And so our Bible lesson tonight is about a covenant that God makes with Abram. And it's an important Bible lesson because God has made a covenant promise, not only with Abraham, but with every one of us who put our hope and trust in him. And in the same way that God had a plan, a purpose and a promise for Abraham, a promise that included blessing him and making him a blessing to others, he has the very same plan and purpose for your life and mine. But again, laying hold of these promises, seeing them fulfilled in our lives is a journey of faith. And there are some important lessons to be learned along the way if God's destiny is going to be fulfilled 
in our lives. So allow me to share a few principles with you this evening from the life of Abraham that have really helped me through the years and hopefully can be a help to you as well. Here we go, number one. <clears throat> the Lord is your shield, so do not be afraid. The Lord is your shield, so do not be afraid. Genesis 15, verse 1. Here we go. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. The Lord is your shield. So you do not need to be afraid. Yes, we all have to deal with fear, including Abraham. But that fear is to be met and overcome by faith in our God who says, I will be your shield. And when God is your shield, you don't have to put up a big front. You, you, you don't have to be a tough guy. You don't have to defend yourself. Instead, you have to believe that God is going to protect you. And after the dust has settled, you'll still be standing. And after all, think about this for a minute. If, <clears throat> if God doesn't protect you, who really can? Hello? We're not sure why Abram was afraid, but God lets him know your relationship with me is one based on faith, not fear. Maybe Abram was concerned about the five kings and their armies that he had just defeated in a midnight attack in Genesis 14 to rescue his nephew Lot. But the plain truth of the matter is you're probably going to make a few enemies following the Lord. Enemies with your fellow man and certainly enemies from among the forces of darkness. So you need to decide if you're going to live life on the basis of fear of others or faith in God. As for fearing man, Proverbs 29, 25 says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. As for the forces of darkness, 1 John 4, 4 reminds us, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Paul told Timothy in his last letter as he prepared to face the executioner's acts that would remove his head. He said, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. At least part of what Paul was telling Timothy was, you cannot lead from fear, you must lead from faith. Occasionally a pastor will seek me out for advice on a <clears throat> church matter or problem. I suppose you get old, fat, and bald. People expect you to know something. And they begin to tell their story to me, and I listen to their story, and, and clearly they've got troublemakers in the church. And listen, troublemakers have to be pastored. you got to deal with the troublemakers. And so I kind of make what seems to be an ob obvious observation to the pastor and... Uh, and then I can't tell you how many times their response is this. If I had a nickel for every time I heard this. But Pastor Tim, they are the biggest givers in the church. Now I'm not suggesting for a moment that, that we don't use wisdom, counsel, discernment in dealing with difficult people. But I'm telling you, you have to decide if you're going to lead from fear or faith. Fear is contagious. Faith is contagious. They're both contagious. And haven't we seen that over the last two years? I'm not suggesting for a moment that any of us have not had our anxious moments over these last two years. I'm right there with you. We've all been there. But I must admit that it has been a bit disconcerting to see so many pastors, so many leaders making decisions based on fear instead of faith. The just shall live by faith. And guess what? The just shall lead by faith as well. Consider the example of David and Goliath. We know the story. Goliath is on the mountaintop there shouting his threats, and the Israelite soldiers are in their, in their tents, shaking in their boots, literally. David comes along, gives a demonstration of faith and confidence in God, kills Goliath, and all of a sudden the Israelites find their courage, and the scriptures say they spent the rest of the day chasing the Philistines. They said, we're going to follow this guy, David. Why? Because people do not want to follow a coward. 
People want to follow a man or woman of faith. Interestingly enough, Genesis 15 is the first time in the Bible we see the phrase, fear not or do not be afraid, though it certainly will not be the last. God says to Abraham, and he says to you and me, if you're going to inherit the promises and the blessings I have for your life, you need to understand that fear will not get you there. But if you'll trust me, I'll protect you. I'll be your shield. I'll get you to the finish line. Number two. Second thing we need to understand as we follow the Lord and move toward the fulfillment of his promises for our lives Number two is that the Lord is your reward, so you've already got everything you need. <clears throat> we heard this from Dr. Kim this morning. The Lord is your reward, so you have everything you need. Genesis 15, one again. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your very great reward. Now, I don't know what kind of reward some might be looking for today, but, but God tells Abram, when you have me, you have everything you need. I think Abram knew that because of what we saw him do at the end of the previous chapter. Remember? After he rescued his nephew Lot, he was greeted by two kings, one good king, one bad king. The good king, the godly king, King Melchizedek, who was also a priest of God, we read that Ab Abram paid him tithes of everything to the wicked king of Sodom who tried to bribe Abram and offered him the spoils of war, Abram said, keep your money. I'm not going to let anyone take credit for making me rich except God. And let's not kid ourselves, folks. The financial swing between refusing the bribe from the bad king and tithing to the good king, that was a significant financial swing in terms of the natural eye or according to Wall Street. But Abram is a great example for us of determining where your reward lies and how you're going to get rich, God's way or man's way. God's way begins by recognizing that he and he alone is your exceedingly great reward. And one of the ways we acknowledge that every payday is by giving at least 10% back to him. We honor him with his tithe, a recognition that he is everything we need, and he is our ultimate source and supply. He's our reward. He's our reward. Or others try to find it in worldly wealth, and yet God has a reward. He has a blessing for us. We're told in Proverbs 10, 22, the blessings of the Lord maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. But lest you confuse my point here and think I'm talking about worldly wealth, listen to Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. This speaks so eloquently about Moses who understood what it meant to have the Lord as his ultimate reward. Here's what we read, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I would call that the world's riches. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And we lost it. We lost it, didn't we? I wonder, because I, I, I'm looking at the back wall, not for the scripture reference, but for the clock, because I really was kidding when I said we were going to be here hours, but... Uh, we want to get that clock working again or we're all in trouble. You know, sometimes, sometimes we, we hear about the sacrifices that are made by those in full-time vocational ministry. And I understand the point, I do, especially as it relates to many of our missionaries overseas who make tremendous sacrifices that most Americans, including American pastors, know nothing of. But honestly, loved ones, how can we ever really think in terms of sacrifice when God himself is our reward? I mean, when the Lord becomes to you the fountain of everything meaningful in life, you will never be disappointed no matter what happens or doesn't happen on your schedule or wish list. And you won't have to worry about what this world calls success or status or fortune and fame, a living and vibrant relationship with the creator of the universe is your reward. That kind of understanding, it frees you from being unduly influenced by so many of the things that this world calls important for nothing. Nothing is more important than God's plans and purposes for your life and mine. 
being fulfilled. The Lord says to Abraham, and he says to you and me tonight, I am your, as some translations read, I am your exceedingly great reward. A big church is not your reward. A big ministry is not your reward. A big budget, a big building is not your reward. A big God is your reward. A faithful God is your reward. And may God forgive us for the multiple times he has to remind us of this great truth. This is the first time we see the word reward in the Bible. And the reward is God himself. Let's never forget that. Number three. The Lord is your guide, so trust him and take him at his word. The Lord is your guide, so trust him, take him at his word. I've been highlighting words or phrases tonight that are seen for the first time in the Bible here in Genesis 15, and here's another one. It's this reference to the word of the Lord or God speaking. Listen to this, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Abram. Verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him. Verse 5, he, God, took him outside and said. Verse 5, then he said. Verse 7, he also said to him. Verse 9, so the Lord said. Verse 13, then the Lord said to him. Verse 18, on that day, the Lord God made a covenant with Abram and said. Eight times God speaks. Eight times the word of the Lord comes to Abram with most of those times coming in response to questions that Abram still has about the promise that God made to him. How many know sometimes you have to tell your children something more than once? How many, how many will be honest and admit your heavenly father has found it necessary to tell you something more than once? Thank God he's willing to repeat himself. Apparently, he understands that his promises to us are so great and our ability at times to believe is so limited that he tells us again and again and again. Please notice that God did not blow Abraham away just because he asked a few questions. Asking questions does not, does not necessarily indicate doubt. In fact, to a great extent, it indicates just the opposite, a belief that God is going to do it but a desire to understand more of the details. Boy, we want details. So Abram asked God about the fact that he still doesn't have a son. He asked God, how's he going to make it all come to pass? And everything hinges on what happens next. Two things. God speaks, and Abram believes. God speaks, Abram believes, and God is still speaking today. And guess what? He still speaks to us the same way through his word. The Bible is the living word of God. It is what he has spoken to us. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. How was Abraham made right in the eyes of God? Not by something he did, not by something he said. He was made righteous before God because he heard the word of the Lord and he believed him. And while we are all quick to say, yes, we believe in justification by faith, we understand we're saved by grace through faith, and we understand all of that because it's promised to us in God's word. My question for us tonight, though, is what other promises does God have for us in his word that he's waiting for us to believe and act upon? Promises for our families? Promises for our ministries, promises for our churches and this network. Paul says of Abraham in Romans 4, 20 and 21, he says, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding, regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded. Are you fully persuaded tonight? Fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. My question is, what promise has God given you? And are you fully persuaded that he has the power to do what he promised? Thank God for the promise of salvation. But God's word is filled with all kinds of other promises. 
regarding God's plans and purposes for our lives, we have to decide whether or not we're going to believe it. You say, but I don't have a promise from God about my life or ministry. Oh, yes, you do. You just haven't read it yet. Get into God's word. Read it daily. You say, you realize you're talking to ministers. I know exactly who I'm talking to. Get into his word daily. Listen for his voice as he will surely make the scriptures come alive with the promises he has for you. Every dream, every vision, without exception, that has come to pass in my life and ministry found its basis in the Word of God, including the promise he gave me on January 15, 1993, almost 30 years ago. As I read the words of Micah 7, 11, and 12, which you know how it works, they jump off the page and grab you by the neck. I heard the word of the Lord and I believed it. I believe the words which I read there in Micah 7, 11, and 12. Here's what it says. The day for building your walls will come. Now we had 50 or 60 people who were all 50 or 60 years of age. Some of them say, Pastor, I wasn't that old. I say, it's my lie. Let me tell it, all right? The day for building your walls will come. The day for extending your boundaries. In that day, people will come to you. Guess what? They've been coming for 34 years. But it didn't come to pass overnight. It's been 30 plus years. Settle in. Do the work of the ministry. The Lord has been my shield, so I've had no reason to fear. The Lord has been my reward, so regardless of when or how the promise comes to pass, I already have everything I need in the Lord. I knew the Lord was my guide. I knew he had given me a promise from his word, so I trusted him and took him at his word. But there's a fourth ingredient to seeing God's promise fulfilled in our lives, and this one has its challenges because, once again, it has to do with waiting. And I discovered, like Abraham, number four, the Lord has a bigger perspective than you and me. So engage in worship and warfare while you wait. The Lord has a bigger perspective than you and me, so engage in worship and warfare while you wait. Abraham asked God to clarify for him how was he going to fulfill the promise of giving him a son. He believed God's word, but was now asking for a new clarity, fresh perspective on how the vision, how's this promise going to come to pass? And so God tells Abraham to do one thing. He says, go get a couple of animals and sacrifice them to me in an act of worship. And of course, slain animals in the Old Testament, typically a picture of the sacrifice that would be offered for us once and for all through Jesus Christ. While this is not the first altar that Abraham has built, it may very well be the first time that a blood sacrifice has been offered by him. And so Abram prepares the sacrifice, lays it out in an act of worship, and waits for God to show up. And loved ones, that's not terribly different from what God asks of us each and every day of our lives. Only in our case, we offer up to him our lives as a living sacrifice. For Romans 12, 1 tells us, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so we commit to worshiping the Lord, to following the Lord, to serving the Lord, and to taking him at his word, believing the promises, even though he doesn't always show up as quickly as we would like. Show up, that is, in the context of revealing to us how he's going to fulfill the promises and when he's going to fulfill the promises. How and when? Those are the questions we all have for God, aren't they? They're the questions Abram had for God as well. How are you going to do it, God, and when are you going to do it? And God says, just worship me. Just worship me. When you're confused or a little disillusioned and you, you have far more questions than you do answers, offer up to him the sacrifice of praise. 
Start every day with a commitment to laying down your life for him and walking in whatever light he gives you for that day. But notice what else is going to take place. Genesis 15, 11. Genesis 15, 11 says, Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. Guess what? Every promise of God you receive is going to be attacked by birds of prey. And every act of worship and service for God, every step of faith you take in obedience to the promises of God, they're going to face attack from the birds of prey. Why? Because the last thing the devil wants is for you to move into the fulfillment of God's plans and promises for your life. And he tries to stop you. Even at conversion, we see from Jesus' teaching on the, the sower and the seed, Luke 8, 5, he says a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering his seed, some fell along the path, it's trampled on, and the birds of the air, birds of prey, ate it up. Jesus interprets the parable a few verses later, Verses 11 and 12, he says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. What are we talking about, church? We're talking about spiritual warfare. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6, 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know another word, another, what another word is for those forces of darkness, birds of prey. And they continue, and they come to not only try to steal your salvation, but they come to steal your joy. They come to steal your peace. They come to steal your faith and confidence in the promises of God for your life. But loved ones, the word of God says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So here's Abram offering his sacrifice to the Lord, worshiping the Lord, waiting on God for a fresh vision, and these vultures come along and try to steal a sacrifice. And I'm really disappointed because I had some pictures of the meanest, ugliest looking vultures you've ever seen. And uh, media being media, thank God for the geniuses who run the media. It's not the geniuses who run the media, it's the media. In fact, there's probably some vultures got in the media, did That's what happened, huh? <laughs> I call them vision vultures, and any time God's about to give you a fresh word, you can rest assured the devil has his vision vultures hanging around to try to steal the victory from you. In fact, you may find it necessary and important to pray even as you're preparing your messages each week. Father God, in the name of Jesus and through the power of your blood, Holy Spirit, keep the vision vultures away from me as I'm preparing the word of God to preach on Sunday. My first year in Linfield, not making this up, not exaggerating. For one year, I struggled with what I called devil birds who would come and sit on my right shoulder and my left. And Nick, you know what these devil birds told me? Nothing good. In fact, what they said, <clears throat> whispering in my ear, you are the worst preacher that has ever preached a sermon in the history of preaching. You get the gold medal for being the worst preacher ever. Look out on the fifth row. You see that guy? He's asleep, and you're only in your introduction. <laughs> now, we laugh, and I can laugh now, too, but I promise you, 34 years ago, it wasn't funny. And I'm struggling, and I'm preaching to the Wood family because, you know, the Wood, the, the, the pews, you know, I mean, the Wood family. I said, listen, I love all people. I don't love the Wood family. But man, you're preaching to a handful of people in, a, in an auditorium that seats so many more. Looky there, we got, oh, well, we got them in the back. I don't know if we got them in the front. Can you put those vultures up there? Well, we'll get the, at least we got it on the back, and at least we got, all right. That looks like somebody in your congregation doesn't, don't, don't say that. Come on, come on. Here, listen, I know it's not easy sometimes holding on to the promises of God. You're doing the best you know how to do. You're committed to hanging on to God in faith. You're offering up the sacrifice of praise and worshiping God, even though you feel dead and dried up on the inside. And to make matters worse, you've got some birds of prey to do battle with. 
And as if all that were not enough, we read that nightfall starts setting in and there's still no sign of God showing up. And I really don't know how to break the news to some of you. But dark times will come for all of us. Even as we try to pursue God's promises for our lives. Listen to Genesis 15, 12. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. How many this here, how many here this evening know what I'm talking about? In fact, I think if you, I'm not a, I'm not a biblical, I'm not a language uh, Hebrew scholar, but I'm pretty sure if you check the original language, Pastor Paul, the Hebrew there for darkness is called COVID. <laughs> COVID. And the darkness is so thick around you, you feel like you can't, you can't see your hand in front of your face. You feel like the Lord has left you, gone to the farthest side of the universe and left you alone to face your crisis by yourself. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, financial setback, the dreaded diagnosis of cancer from the doctor, disappointment in someone you expected more from, discouragement, depression, or desertion by those closest to you in the ministry. Or, or maybe, just maybe, it's that nagging doubt that just maybe God isn't going to keep his promise. And the darkness is so thick it feels like it's suffocating you. Abram went through that. Abram experienced that. And though I may be taking some liberty with the text here, I don't think I'm overdoing it too much, but I see Abraham laying out his sacrifice and he's waiting for God to show up and then these vultures start coming around and he, he starts spending his time, you know, he's supposed to be worshiping and yet he's got to spend time doing warfare as well and keeping these stinking vultures away from what he's trying to offer up to God and he's going at it so fast and so furious until finally he just passes out. Falls asleep. I'm saying he passed out. Or maybe God knocked him out. But thank God the chapter doesn't end at Genesis 15, 12, which talks about this dreaded darkness coming over Abram. Listen to the very next verse. Then the Lord said. Then the Lord said. Newsflash, God speaks to us in the darkness. When things look the darkest and we've come to the end of ourselves, when we can't see anything, he sees everything. When we are most vulnerable, he is most powerful. And the darkness that makes you feel as though he is at his greatest distance is the very time he proves to be closest of all. Psalm 1811 tells us we serve a God who dwells in the darkness. We serve a God who works in the dark. He did it at creation. He did it at Israel's deliverance from Egypt, and he did it at the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And just like those times, so it is that he creatively, redemptively, and victoriously works in our dark times as well, including these dark days of COVID. And he speaks to us from passages like Isaiah 45, 3, where he says, I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. And so it is that God talks to Abram during his blackout, as it were. He gives to Abram an enlarged vision and perspective of just how the promise is going to be filled, fulfilled. And, and guess what Abram learns during that time? Abram, it's not all about you. I'm a firstborn probably type A. When everything goes good, I figure I must have done something right. And then when something goes wrong, the other side of that coin, it's all my fault. God says, well, at least thank God. Hey, aren't you grateful COVID is not your fault? I mean, COVID was not your fault, okay? God says, Abraham, here's the big picture. There's 400 years of this, that, and the other I'm doing. I'm working with these people over here, and I'm working with these people over there. It's not all about you. You are one piece of the puzzle. Get a, get a grip. Get a picture of the big picture. It's not all about you. Man, I don't want to tell you how many times God has had to have that conversation with me. 
And Abram learns, hey, God's using me to change history. So just, just trust him. Engage in worship and warfare while you wait. But whatever you do, especially during the days of darkness, don't jump ship. But listen even more carefully, for it could be that God is about to reveal more to you about your life and his plans and purposes for you than you've ever known before. Last point, as the musicians come, please. We'll pretend like we're quitting. Number five. You could have laughed at that. <laughs> Last point. The Lord fulfills the covenant because we can't, so rest in him. The Lord fulfills the covenant because we can't, so rest in him. Here it is, Genesis 15, verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, Abram is still out of it now, smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces, talking about the sacrifice. On that day, the Lord made a covenant. Abraham didn't make any covenant. The Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land. And most of you, certainly if you've preached this chapter, you understand this Middle Eastern culture where you take the animals and you cut them in half and you put them uh, uh, you know, in parallel lines apart from each other, leaving room in the middle for the two people making the covenant to walk between the, 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 the animals that have been cut in half and you're shaking hands and this is the way you did business in those days and this is our agreement and if I don't keep the agreement, may I be cut in half like these animals. Amazingly though, Amazingly, God has paralyzed Abram with sleep so that only God can walk between the dead animals. Why? Because only God can fulfill the covenant. There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to fulfill the covenant. Isaiah tells us our righteousness is as filthy rags. We were all paralyzed by sin and there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. And again, we understand that principle when it comes to our salvation. Can I encourage you tonight to apply it to your life of service to God and His church? Meaning, God's promise is not going to be fulfilled in our ministry because we work so hard. And trust me, I've got a staff here that will tell you I believe in working hard. But God's promise is going to be fulfilled because it's God's promise. And because we dare to believe him and to trust him to do what only he could do. For the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. God knew the covenant would never survive if it was dependent upon Abraham or you or me. Thankfully, the covenant is dependent upon God and he is faithful. Our part is to believe, to say amen to God's great faithfulness, for God is keeping his promise to every one of you. He's keeping his promise. He's a promise keeper. And I promise you, he has not quit on you. Don't you dare quit on him. If you'd stand to your feet with me. We're going to sing something spiritual, I'm sure. <laughs> And I don't know how, you know, I don't know how you want to respond. I know how I like people to respond on Sunday. I'm probably not different than how you like people to respond on Sunday. And I know we've had to worry about COVID cooties for all these years. And, but there is something about finding a place around an altar to respond. And, and could I say respond not just to what God is saying tonight in this service, but all day long. Oh, my goodness. We've had a whole day of God just pouring stuff into us. And, and before we rush out in fellowship and all that good stuff, it's all good. Maybe just take a few more moments. Maybe you want to get with a, a brother or a sister and say, hey, would you pray with me? And I don't know if, you know if what you need tonight is a promise from God. If you don't feel like you've got a promise, I would ask God for a promise. Or maybe you're, you're you know, you're, you're dealing with fear. And, and, and I don't mean to minimize, you know, 
those rich people in the church sometimes not always but sometimes you know that you got to make a hard call and you know there's going to be real consequences it's not easy i understand that but you can't let fear be calling the shots you got to take god at his word trust the promises he's given you commit your life to worshiping him and trusting him so i close with this story i mentioned at the beginning that we would take our girls uh, to creation it's a 500 mile trip and, and uh, most years we just stay right through the weekend but one year we had to be back for Sunday services it was July 4th weekend we had something called celebrate America and I just felt like I got to be there and so and so we left it sometime on Saturday so that we could be back by 9 a.m. the next Sunday morning and we got in that 15 passenger van we loaded it all up and headed home. And I drove all night long in the dark. And you know what the children did? They slept. They slept the whole night through. But here's the point. Daddy got them home. Brother and sister, I don't care what kind of darkness you're going through. And you may feel like passing out or you may feel like you're already passed out. Maybe you're at the point where you just, I, 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 can't, do any, I can't do anything else. It's okay. But you rest in him. Your daddy is going to get you home. Your father is keeping his promise to you. So let's worship the Lord. Let's respond however you would feel led by the Spirit to respond kneel at your seat, come around this altar, pray with one another, but oh my, let's lay hold of the promises of God tonight. Amen. God bless you. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You'll never fail And I know the night won't Still
not going to close the service. I want you to remain as long as you want. We'll keep some music going. Father, we love you. Thank you for this word. We hold it in our heart. We trust you with it. In Jesus' name. Please feel free to stay as long as you need. We are, because of the thunderstorm and stuff outside, we're not having any after party, but we'll see you in the morning. And um, Tim, thank you. And uh, God bless you all. Your